functions have their own notation system in the sense of, hey, fx is equal to, well, some function of x. Now, fx here, we, uh, if we graph this, we label the axes appropriately. So this isn't going to be y anymore, unless, of course, we set y equals fx, or y equals gx as well, because if we want to plot, say, gx and fx on the same coordinate grid, we're going to need to have y or fx and gx. So we can use fx, gs, gx, hx, and so on. We can use all sorts of letters to denote that the function of x is equal to 2x plus 3. The reason why fx is the most common is the function of x. Hey, what do you think they're going to use? u or n for the last letter of function? No. So fx is the uh, most common notation. Now, the x is the independent variable here, hence why it's on the horizontal axis, and the dependent variable is on the vertical. So, please note, though, that in functions, a lot of the stuff we do uh, actually doesn't have to do anything to do with graphing. Instead, we're going to just do algebra. So, fx equals 2x plus 3, so f negative 1 equals 2 times negative 1 plus 3 and f of 0 well this would be negative 2 plus 3 which is equal to 1 f of 0 is equal to 2 times 0 plus 3 equals 3 and then of course there's f of 3, which is equal to 2 times 3 plus 3 equals 6 plus 3 equals 9. Now, what about this example here? Similarly, we just substitute right in, which means that we have f of negative 1 equals negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1 plus 1. So that's 1 plus 2 plus 1 equals 4. Okay. Now what about f of 0? I mean, we uh, could write that down here and still be in view of that, but then we're going to start a new column because we only have so much space for this problem. So f of 0 is equal to 0 squared minus 2 times 0 plus 1, which is going to be 1. Now f of 4... This is not read as fx, it's called f of x, usually. Of course, regional conventions may vary. So, this is equal to 4 squared minus 2 times 4 plus 1. So, this is equal to 16 minus 8 plus 1 equals 9. Now, we could have done this a different way. Why? Because, look at this f of x. Equals x squared minus 2x plus 1. So, this is equal to x minus 1 squared. So, we could have done it like this instead if we felt like it. But, uh... We decided not to because we would have had to substitute, subtract, then take exponent anyway, which would have resulted in a comparable number of total steps. 
Now, of course, when you are actually doing a complex problem, this is a very good idea to make substitutions less long-winded. Okay, example three, find the value of each function if x equals three. Well, here we would have f of three is equal to three squared minus one equals nine minus one equals eight. Now what about this one? Yes, it is true that this can be uh, factored to be x plus one squared, but that is optional. If we feel like it, we could write that first. squared over x minus 5 and g of 3 would be equal to 3 plus 1 squared over 3 minus 5. So that's 4 squared over negative 2 equals negative 8. So some areas will ask you to write then g3 and f3 on the last line. Others uh, don't really care about that. So map notation is one that will almost never be used uh, after this section or this chapter, uh, simply because it is ridiculously clunky, uh, to put it very, very politely. Why? Well, this is a mapping diagram that's for a function. See how different values in the domain can have the same value in the range. However, if you have one value in the domain having multiple values in the range, then it is not a function. So this is one way to write functions in mapping notation. And um, this is how you read it. F is a function that maps x to x squared plus 3x minus 4. I am quite sure we all understand just from reading this and perhaps head desking proverbially or literally uh, that function notation is much more popular for very good reasons. Uh, but we still need to know the, these so that we have some idea of what we're looking at if we ever come across one, right? So that's why we're talking about this, sadly. So if we write each function as mapping notation, we would have g x to x cubed plus 5. Now for this example down here, we would of course uh, also have this. I think you can probably hear the parts that I'm not saying about my opinion of this system of doing things. <clears throat> but hopefully uh, with this, if you ever happen to see something written this way, you will know what it's saying. Despite how uh, much wow it is. Okay, so example five. Given this relationship and g2 is equal to five, find the value of g8. What does this relationship actually give us? So suppose we uh, do this. gx equals g x plus 1 plus 3. So suppose we rearrange by moving this over. Now that would give us g 
x plus 1 equals gx minus 3. So for every time you increase x by 1, the value of gx will decrease by 3. So if g2 is equal to 5, then g8 must be plus 1, the value of x, gx drops by 3. So g2 equals 5. gives g8 equals 5 minus 8 minus 2 times 3. This is a method that uh, will pass muster but isn't necessarily the most efficient way of writing things. Regardless, it manages to communicate well enough the point that this comes out to 5 minus 6 times 3. So 5 minus 18. This is equal to negative 13. Some p teachers prefer if you write what you're actually finding here. So we have found the value of G8. So a slightly harder than average problem here, again. We have HX is a linear function. Given H, H3 is equal to 2, H of H of 2 is equal to 1, find the value of H of 0. So we know that hx is a straight line. So hx equals ax plus b. So what have we here? We have h, h of x is equal to h of ax plus b, which means a times ax plus b plus b. So that's a squared x plus a b plus b. Now we know that h of h of 3 is h of 3 is equal to 2. Therefore, 3a squared plus ab plus b is equal to 2. Okay, what about the other one? h, h of 2. h of h of 2 is equal to 1. So what we have here is 2a squared plus ab plus b is equal to 1. What does this give us? So suppose this item here is number 1 and this is number 2. What do we get when we subtract them? Minus 2. This gives us a squared equals 1. A equals plus or minus 1. Now, find the value of H0. How do we find the value when it's just B? Well, we can find a 
AB plus B by suppose we have 3 times 2 minus 2 times 1. This would give us 3 of 2 that's 6a squared, and 2 of 1, oh, that's 6a squared as well, which would give us ab plus b equals 3 of 2. Hmm, that's 3 on this side, minus 2 of 1, that's 4 over here. So that's negative 1. And what can we get from this? First of all, we know that b is clearly not 0. And what else can we get from this? Other than that b is not 0, we also get from this. So this gives us b is not 0 and a equals 1. Why? Because if a was not equal to 1, what would happen? We would have Oh, a is negative 1, so negative b plus b is, it has to be 0. They have to cancel out. So, that means a here must be 1, and so 2b equals negative 1, b is equal to negative 1 half. So, Please note that here I wrote ax plus b, but sometimes you see, very often you see it written as mx plus b for a linear function. So h of 0 is, well, ax plus b a times 0 plus b which is equal to 1 times 0 plus negative 1 half because the substitution step should always be written out fully and this is negative 1 half. Okay, well, this next example here we have fx plus 2gx is equal to this, 2fx plus 3gx is equal to this. Find the value of f2 plus g3. So, suppose we label this 1 and we label this 2. What would happen if we took 2 times 1 minus 2? Well then, okay, first of all we have 2fx minus 2fx. Okay, that cancels right out. But honestly, if we just do that verbally, this gets a little bit long. And we are going to end up slightly prone to errors, which means that let's do this the uh, longer way, but less uh, error prone way. 2fx plus 4gx minus 2fx minus 3g of x and this is equal to well 2 times 12 is 24x squared plus 2 times 3 is 6x and 16 and minus 18x squared minus 6x minus 13. Of course, if you feel like it, you could well put brackets around these and have these as the same symbols as they were here. So, what this comes out to, first of all, we cancel out the fx's. This leaves us, leaves us with g of x is equal to 24x squared minus 18x squared, that is 6x squared. And the minus 6 and plus 6 happen to cancel out very nicely. So plus 16 minus 13, that is plus 3. Now, 
sub into 1, and we get fx plus 2 times 6x squared plus 3, and this is equal to 12x squared plus 3x plus 8. Which gives us ultimately f of x plus 12x squared plus 6 is equal to 12x squared plus 3x plus 8. So we can immediately cancel out the 12x squared. So f of x is equal to 3x plus 8 minus 6, which means 3x plus 2. So what are we looking for? We're looking for f2 plus g3. f of 2 plus g of 3 is equal to 3 times 2 plus 2 plus g of 3, which means 6, 3 squared plus 3. And this is 3 times 2 is 6 plus 2 plus 6 times 9 is 54 plus 3. So here we have a total of 65. This is essentially just a matter of systems of equations. So sometimes you will see these slightly more complex than average problems, but as long as you remember how we solve systems of equations way back when, we can just treat these as basically just other variables. So when we find what these variables essentially are in terms of x, in this case, or y, or z, or whatever they used, then we can very quickly figure out what any uh, sums or differences or whatever ratios they're looking for happen to be. Of course, sometimes you find that, hey, I uh, have to find a bunch of ratios. Hmm. Well, what you can do to make finding, say, a bunch of ratios like fx over gx easier is to do some factoring because potentially if they have common factors you can simplify off quite a number of steps where you can potentially make uh, annoying slip-ups or a lot save yourself quite a bit of writing so that's it for this section and we'll see each other again then next section mm -hmm.